Hello, hello, and welcome again to a Beatles podcast that we call Things We Said Today. This is a weekly show, a talk show in which we talk about anything that has to do with the Beatles. It could be any part of their history, about anything going on today. We could examine any of their works, their songs, their albums, you name it. I'm Ken Michaels. I'm one of the co-hosts of the show, also known from my other Beatles program called Every Little Thing, being joined by my regular co-hosts. First of all, the man who writes for Beatles Examiner and so many other Examiner columns, Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hello, everyone. Also, we have uh, one of the writers for Beatle Fan Magazine, who was there since its inception many, many years ago. That being Al Sussman. Hi, Al. Hi, Ken. Hello there, everybody. And we also have our resident musicologist and freelance writer, also a writer for Beatle Fan, that being Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hey, Ken, and hello, everyone. And once again, we welcome another writer for Beatle Fan, who also is involved very much with the Fest for Beatle Fans and also with Joe Johnson's Beatle Brunch. We welcome back Tom Fran Joan. Hi, Tom. Hey, Yay! 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 Rouse, rouse. Throw money. No. Um, <laughs> well, guys, good to be back with you, uh, especially since uh, we have what I think is going to be a terrific, terrific topic to talk about. Well, certainly since Tom has been on the show, he's been lobbying for this, uh, <laughs> for this particular topic. Did he pay us? <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> well, well I, I would, but the pound is sinking. Uh, oh, uh, man, that, that man is ready for anything. Oh, man, he's, he's loaded for bear tonight, kids. <laughs> <laughs> well, then we'll have to get it. Yeah. Get it. Ooh. There you go. Uh, all right, so why don't we take it away? Oh, you're good. You're good. <laughs> oh, my God. This is getting what embarrassing. Is that you're doing? Oh, no, it's not, Ken. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here today. Ah. Uh, how are we going to work Ebony and Ivory into this? Well, it's you think it's as black and white as we always think. <laughs> if you haven't guessed already... <laughs> We're going to talk about the Tug of War album. And this was an album that Paul released in 1982. It's generally regarded as one of his finest albums, although the reason why we have Tom on the show is because he rates this album not only as Paul McCartney's greatest album, solo album, but also as the very best solo Beatle album of all time. Now, I know that uh, for those of us who followed my radio show in New Jersey, where I was on for 10 years at WDHA, many was the time I called the album the best album Paul has released. Um, and certainly since then, I've maintained that it's one of his best. It actually hasn't, it doesn't rank number one anymore for me. Sorry, Tom. Yeah. But um, we're going to find out why Tom feels this way. And uh, certainly, you know, it is, it is generally accepted as, as definitely one of the best of Paul's uh, solo career. But I'd like to start the conversation, obviously, with you, Tom, to find out what it is about this particular album. And you know Paul has made a lot of great albums in his solo oh, career. Yeah, you know, whenever I, I, I throw that gauntlet down, people say, what do you mean, what about Band on the Run? You know what I dislike about Band on the Run? Nothing. <laughs> That's a great <laughs> album, too. Um, I don't know, Tug of War, to me, just always seemed to be, um, to borrow a phrase, the one... Like you always knew he had in him, um, top to bottom, it's immaculately produced, and we'll we'll talk about who uh, whose hand was in there, uh, George Martin. Actually, even in retrospect, as I think the album has aged just fine, you know, we know through the unreleased recordings and things that circulate that there was enough material for a double album, and probably the you know the the first you know big W in the column for this album was. I think paring it down to the very best material. The, some of the stuff that was left over ended up on Pipes of Peace, which I enjoy, but is clearly not in the same league as Tug of War. It was clearly you know, made up of a lot of leftovers. Um, and, I mean, it has some terrific songs on it uh, that were even written after the Tug of War sessions. But you know, the, the stuff that was held over, I think, was held over uh, was a, a good judgment call on probably George Martin's part. Uh, as producer and and you know the the extra set of ears on the material. What's interesting is not a lot of people realize. I mean, everyone everyone kind of I think associates it with you know its release date eighty two, 
And, you know, the fact that it was Paul's first album after John passed away, that's to say the first album as the Beatles are now officially never going to reunite. And they're officially now, you know, the page is turned. They're now part of history as opposed to, you know, maybe they're still going to be around and still thought of somehow collectively, um, even though they hadn't worked together in, in a better part of a decade. But most of that material that was on there, better than half the album, was written and recorded before John died. And I'm not, not going to rule out, um, you know, John, you know, mentioned, uh, you know, in more than one interview that coming up kind of, you know, woke him up a little bit and said, wow, you know, he's writing something that, that's pretty cool here and the guy's a good groove and, you know, maybe Mac has found the edge again. And you know somehow that that, that you know, would, you know, reverberate with Paul saying, okay, you know, as a confidence builder, that's pretty good to have, you know, a guy who was always super critical of his work uh, to now start liking what he was doing. And a lot of that, a lot of the songs that were recorded in 80, you know, are, are some of the best songs on the album. The ones that were recorded afterwards, clearly here today was recorded after, you know, after 1980, um, you know, stand just as strong. The material itself, I think some of the songs themselves stand up as great songs. And I think I look to no further than the recent Art of McCartney collection, which was, you know, fun to listen to, had some really terrific, you know, performances and some that, you know, sounded kind of like, you know, Paul McCartney karaoke night. Mm. Uh, you know, they have his band doing his arrangements and it's just a different vocalist in there. But uh, I think the strongest performance, um, you know, was testament to the fact that a great song is a great song is a great song is a great song. And it was Wanderlust. Okay, mm. fair enough. It was Brian Wilson, <laughs> mm. who I also love. Yeah. Um, but the song, the, the structure of the song, the counterpoint in the, in the lead vocals, you know, the, the, the melody line sitting atop the chord changes is, you know, it's, it's somewhat classic in its structure, but his gift of melody just carries it, you know, from, from beginning to end. The production with some of, and if we talk about Wanderlust, you know, clearly, you know, the, the brass arrangements sound very much like something Martin would have done with the Beatles. The, the string arrangements certainly in here today, you know, reek of what he did with the Beatles in the middle period. Um, and even, you know, the, the cellos, you know, that, that close out uh, the title song, Take It Away, I'm sorry, Tug of War as it goes into Take It Away. Very, very Beatley in its sound without being so overtly Beatley, like, you know, the, let's say a Mark Hudson production of a Ringo song where they are the <laughs> lyrics and the, you know, <laughs> You know, and everything right down to the melody line. You know, the arrangements were done really, really well. And I think, you know, Paul, looking up with George Martin was the first uh, first real big master stroke for doing this. It kind of, you know, gets me thinking, uh, you know, you guys know, and certainly Al knows, because I bounce all of these off of him. You know, I'm, I'm a great fan of putting together, you know, what if kind of collections and what we used to call in Beatle fan magazine, DIYs. Yeah, said, if you look at the material that, you know, 10 years in the rearview mirror now, the Beatles were, um, you know, if they just said, you know what, it's been 10 years, let's bring to the table what we've got. You know, John's songs from Double Fantasy, I still think are among his best. You know, the fact that, that they're in Paul's wheelhouse, you know, singing about your wife, your kids and life at home uh, was kind of interesting. But, you know, had John brought those songs and Paul brought what he brought for Tug of War, and remember, you know, now George had written these maybe a drop earlier, but we didn't hear about them till uh, somewhere in England in 81. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, some even some of the stuff they rejected for that, like Flying Hour, yeah. he brings that to the it's table. Fantastic. And mm. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, the Beatle record that could have been in 1980, I mean, the, the Beatle record of 1971 has been done to death. Books yes. About, right? <laughs> uh, the Beatle record of 1980... Go, go try and put that together. Let me know how you do, because mm. there are some great, you know, very beatly just by their definition and their, and their composition are, are, are you know, overwhelmingly beatly. And I'll, I'll go, you know, we've talked about John Paul George. How about Ringo? Yes. You take what he was, you know, he was preparing his album, which mm. became uh, uh, Stop and about. Smell the Roses, and you get mm. a record like, you know, him and Paul doing a cover. Okay, so it's not new material, but... You know, that it's virtually a duet of them doing Sure to Fall, an old, you know, a song the Beatles used to do on the BBC and in the clubs. Um, and it's just a beautifully produced record by McCartney um, of, of him and Ringo. 
you know, doing this old, you know, very country western arrangement of Short of Fall. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and even some of the material Paul wrote around then for Ringo, like Attention. Um, yes. You know, he, he was writing really, really well at that time. You know, beyond here today, which didn't make it into the, the live repertoire for some time, mm. uh, you know, not till much later, you know, he's not done really virtually anything from the album, the occasional, you know, guest spot on Ebony and Ivory with uh, if Stevie Wonder is around or crawling around a White House or something. <laughs> um, but, you know, <laughs> shortly after the album came out, he did a movie, which we all know as Give My Regards to Broad Street. And, you know, say what you want about the movie. What I what I kind of felt at the time about that movie was it was kind of a pale substitute for him not having a band and going on tour. Yeah. This way he got some of his music you know, presented in a different way. And yeah, he drew a few from Tug of War, which was only a year or two old. Fair enough at the right. time. Um, but I don't think he took anything from Pipes of Peace, did he? Um, yeah, so bad. So bad. Oh, yeah, that's right. Oh, so bad, isn't right. It? Uh, but the way he paired up some of these songs, I mean, the, the big production number in the movie was uh, Ballroom Dancing. And the, the, the George Martin slash Ringo... Uh, you know, um, appearance early on, he, he put Wanderlust in amongst yesterday and here today. And yeah. I, I hear today, I hear yeah, it everywhere. Yeah. In a med. Uh, I mean, uh, so he, you know, he, you know, you can't imagine him putting, I don't know, bip bop in the middle. <laughs> of songs, <laughs> but, you know, I think he held that song in high enough regard, even then to, you know, to say, you know, this, this stands along, you know, some of my best work. Mm -hmm. I think Paul has kind of, Held it in high enough regard uh, on a lot of levels. Um, the first time that the catalog was released in '93, uh, all the all the albums came out with bonus cuts where they were available. So, yeah, the first album didn't have any bonus cuts, but there were no B sides and things like that to, uh, mm. to to tack on. Unlike they've done, you know, in the the archive series. But you know, wherever there were B sides, Paul tacked them on, uh, whether they sounded in place or not. Tug of War, there were three B-sides. I'll give you a ring and... Um, rain Clouds. Rain Clouds and the solo version of Ebony and Ivory. And none of those ended up on there. And there was... Red, remember reading somewhere where he almost kind of passed it on just saying, ah, that one was fine just as it was. And I, yeah. I, I'd have to agree with him. It was fine just as it was. And Ebony and Ivory placed there at the end of the album, which, you know, was well known by the time the album came out. It had been a major hit. It kind of resolves the album, you know, and brings it to a nice, a nice full, you know, sense of closure. Mm -hmm. But even in '93, which now is more than a decade after the album originally appeared, he let that one stand on its own, um, and that I think so, there's something to be said for that. It's almost like the way the Beatles albums were treated. I mean, you could easily mm -hmm. take a Beatles album and and add the singles at that time oh, and sure. tack them on as as uh, bonus tracks. But the Beatles right. never did that; they right. kept it all separate. Right, so, but uh, in the 93 series, I mean, he did this down to even Band on the Run. Now, what, what resolves better than Band on the Run? Okay, the big crescendo in 1985, the, in the very best Sgt. Pepper style, they come back and reprise the title track, uh, close it out with Band on the Run. All of a sudden, Country Dreamer or something comes up. It's like, what is he doing here? Mm. Uh, you know, it was so out of place. So out of uh -huh. place. Okay, well, you certainly said a mouthful there, Tom. Yeah. Um, okay, I now it's your this, turn. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, before we get into this whole debate as to whether or not it's his best album, let's all just talk about our feelings about the album and, and whether or not we feel it's one of his best. Uh, I'm not just going to assume that because I feel that way and Tom feels that way. But let's, let's just start with your impression of the album. How about uh, you, Alan? Uh, I think it's definitely one of his best. Um, I wouldn't say his best necessarily, but um, what I like about it, and I listened to it again during the weekend because it had been kind of a while, um, you know, and some of the songs had stuck in my mind much more than others over the years and, and in a way didn't need to listen to them. And But, but I like sort of refreshing the whole thing. Um, there is so much going on on this record, uh, you know, Carl Perkins turning up and Stevie Wonder and uh, even it's funny songs like Ebony and Ivory, which I don't know if I, I think I kind of liked it when it came out and then got kind of sick of it. Um, hearing it again, you know, it's a pretty good song and it has a pretty good message. And uh 
I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, maybe it was one of those things where at the time it was being overplayed or, or something. Um, and, or maybe I had seen the video so many times while dubbing copies for people, <laughs> whatever. Uh, I liked it this time and I, and I thought, you know, maybe I had kind of misjudged it, um, back then here today i think is just a, a gorgeous song um ballroom dancing it's it's hard not to uh picture the you know big production number as tom mm. said from from broad street um and really i think was a highlight of broad street i didn't loathe broad street as much as a lot of people did i mean i i was well aware of its problems which were many but, you know, as a bunch of Paul McCartney solo videos, fundamentally, with a little bit of story stringing it together, uh, I, thought, I thought it was actually kind of fun. Sure, like what they used to call a long-form video, right? Yeah, I mean, was, right, hmm. right. Um, and ballroom dancing was, was, was definitely a highlight of that. Pound is sinking, mm, could take or leave. Um, Wanderlust, absolutely beautiful. Um, Be What You See, again, it's it's a little bit like the Newtopia National Anthem, except that you can hear it. Um, <laughs> oh, and I, I liken it more to "Can You Take Me Back" from the White Album. Has that okay? Yeah, okay. Better. Oh, that's you know, better. 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 Oh, how very handy to have George Martin around. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So you know, there's an awful lot of good stuff on this record, and there's an awful lot of variety, which I think is one of its salient features because of you know, get it and ebony and ivory and you know, ballroom dancing. I mean, it, it, there's, it's just, there's just so much here and take it away. Um, you know, like with ballroom dancing, um, think of the video with John Hurd and, yeah. you, you know, like, Ringo. Think, yeah, George Martin's in that too, isn't he? Yeah. Yes, he is. um, you know, I mean, that was, that was on at the time we're talking about sort of early MTV days and yeah. that thing was on all the time and, um, didn't get sick of that one. Um, really thought that was a good track and a good video. So hearing the record again um, was a, a mostly pleasant experience. I mean, with the sole exception, really, of what's that you're doing, which I thought was garbage. Um, <laughs> <laughs> to, you know, and I'm being polite because of Tom, you know. Um, you see. <laughs> <laughs> don't be polite, Alan. Say what you really feel. Uh, well, I mean, I don't know what our language restrictions are here, but you know which one I would <laughs> Um, yeah, it's uh, like if you were to make an album with, you know, Bip Bop and you needed 11 others to put on, this would definitely be on that record. Mm -hmm. um, so, well, for me. But, you know, and, and it's funny because everything else on the album I, I thought was, was just fine and fun to listen to and, and good to become reacquainted with. And that one, I just couldn't wait till it was over. I mean, I didn't want to press forward because... I wanted to listen to the whole album. Oh, and you got to hear him do She Loves You, Yeah, Yeah, Yeah at the end. Well, yeah, that's true. Yeah, you got to hear that. Come okay. on. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. So basically, yeah, I think it's I, I think it's definitely one of his best. It's a it's a very strong album. And, um, you know, I, I, I kind of actually like Flowers in the Dirt a little better, I think, and, and maybe some others. But uh, it's definitely up there. It's definitely up there. If, if I could if I could only take, you know, uh, three or four or maybe five McCartney albums to a desert island or something, Tug of War would definitely be one of them. Yeah, sure. Okay, very good. I think Tom will accept that. I, I, I could live with it. <laughs> I'd bring three copies of Tug of War. No, I'm like, <laughs> well, that's another thing. I mean, I was, I was reshelving. I'm still reshelving my collection because it just moved. And I must have, uh, you know, six or seven copies of it. Sure. Because, uh, you know, there was the LP, of course. And, and then it came out on CD so many times. And yeah. I've gotten it each that's time. True. Um, so just looking at the different spines, there was a yellow one, and there was you know the Columbia one, and uh, my basic shelf copy now is the '93 one. Until of course, uh, sometime this year, I guess the boxed uh, deluxe version will come out. Well, that's and... going to be nice, that thing. Mm, yeah, mm, yeah, boy, that's for sure. But how are you going to feel, Tom, if if uh, Rain Clouds ends the CD instead of Ebony and Ivory? Well, if, if the track record is anything to go by, all of the bonus stuff would show up on uh, a yeah. That's true. And that is true. there is plenty 
of you know leftover material uh, that didn't even make pipes of peace. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there were there were a bunch of give us a corduroy and uh, you don't know where she came from and all those songs. Which you know, I mean, yeah. God knows what else he's got that we haven't heard. Uh, will probably be it, its own disc, is my guess. Right. Okay. Who sh- who wants to comment next? How about why don't Steve? We, yeah, why don't we go with Steve? Oh, okay. First of all, I should mention that while we are discussing this, Ebony and Ivory was number one on the UK chart this week in 1982. Yes, it was. Yeah. Mm. So we've cut to the anniversary. We did a very. This is a very timely discussion. I agree. This is one of my favorite McCartney albums, and it, basically, it's it's because of the starts with the cohesiveness. It fits together so damn well. Starting with Tug of War, Tug of War just grabs you. I, you know, I don't know how to describe it. I mean, he, well, he starts out. It starts out slow, and he starts out, you know, kind of gentle, and you know, with it's a tug of war. Uh, you don't want me to sing it, but, um, but anyway, he he starts singing it, and and the the whole arrangement just kind of draws you in, kind of like Al Pacino in Godfather Three. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it does it just draws you in and and the the it flows one to the one to the next so beautifully even uh what's that you're doing um you know even that the the flow is just really really good the individual songs uh there's tug of war take it away is is uh uh wonderful i i really like take it away Ballroom dancing is probably one of my favorite moments in the movie because of the live the version they do. It's a great version, and uh, it's just a great it, it's a great song. So you know, I'm glad he I'm glad he used that in the movie. Here today, raise your hands, guys. If here today uh, kind of tugged at your heart there just a little bit the first couple times you heard it. Of course, um, hands up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think I think that with that with everybody. Um, it's a very, you know, it's one of the, it, it, you know, you almost expect to, to see Paul or to hear Paul's voice uh, break on that one. Well, you uh, do when he does it live. That's yeah, right, it sure right, has. right, right. Um, but uh, boy, it, that that's just a, a beautiful one, beautiful song. I, you know, I, I kind of wish those lyrics had, you know, something that had really, really happened, you know, um, and it not had just been a an imaginary conversation it's it's such a great it's such a great song um uh pound of sinking isn't isn't bad um i like pound of sinking uh, you know wanderlust oh, the same thing uh the arrangement on wanderlust is beautiful i have to i have to admit get it i'm an oh, i'm a long time carl perkins fan i love carl perkins yeah <laughs> yes absolutely and for anybody for anybody i think it's out of print but it, worth hunting down is the DVD, My Old Friend. Oh yeah, where, where they, where the two of them talk. And as a matter of fact, I just this past week picked up another copy of the the Carl Perkins album. Um, go cat go. go. Go cat go. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. And it didn't. And the copy I picked up had a different cover, and it didn't have the John Lennon track. Really? And I have never, yes. Wow. Well, and I've, I've never seen the different cover, but I didn't know they they uh, changed or cut a track. Maybe a licensing yes. thing. Mm. Maybe. Uh, I yeah. mean, we all we all know the Lennon track was him doing Blue Suede Shoes right. in Toronto. And so Carl Carl always cited that as his favorite version or his favorite cover version of that song. Mm-hmm. I was, I, as a matter of fact, when I was sitting here going through my doing the research for the show. I came upon an interesting quote. This is kind of not really connected to what we're talking about. He's talking about the Beatles in the studio with him in 64. Mm-hmm. He said they cut Blue Suede Shoes, True Love, and, and, true, and true Love at the same time they did Matchbox and, and uh, Everybody's Trying to Be My Baby and Honey Don't. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Oh, yeah. can you imagine a Beatles, oh. a Beatles version of your true love? Oh, my God. Oh, man. Well, I mean, just having George oh. and... Uh... Dave Edmonds Dave, do it that yeah. time. Exactly. On both. Right. Well, yeah. the only the only thing about that story is that Carl always uh, that whole story about uh, Carl being in the studio with them. I do if you remember the the rockabilly session when with, with George and Ringo, mm-hmm. he mentions he mentions it and and Ringo says something like that's what you tell everybody. <laughs> so, I'm not sure whether to believe that story whether to actually believe that story or not. I mean, 
maybe he, uh, you know, he, he, it, uh, the book I, I just read you from, he says it again. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's true, but it's interesting. Uh, that comment from Ringo, I've always remembered that. So yeah, I love, I love the Paul McCartney, Carl Perkins thing. Um, be what you say. I'll agree with what Tom said. Yeah. That's a great, a great little link track, like wild honey. Mm -hmm. Um, Dress me up as a robber. No, nah, that's okay. It, it didn't really knock me over, but it didn't really hit me real hard. Um, I love the the uh, solo version of uh, Ebony and Ivory a little more than the um, the Stevie Wonder Paul McCartney because of the fact that I've, we've heard that so much. But anyway, I love I do love this album. I really I really do, and it's uh, I, I'm glad to see that he does here today. You know, live. I think that's that's wonderful. I'd love to see him do ballroom dancing. That would be mm. fantastic. Mm -hmm. But anyway, there we go. My long-winded okay, dissertation. <laughs> Before we talk to Al, just in case anyone doesn't know, you made a reference to Go Cat Go, and it, there is the possibility some of our listeners don't know what mm. we're talking about here. So that right. was a CD that Carl Perkins released in the late '90s, I believe. And it's basically him teaming up with a lot of great people in the music industry. Willie Nelson's in there, Paul Simon, John Fogarty, a whole bunch of great people. And all four Beatles are represented on, on that CD. Right. You do have the Plastic on All Band live version from Live Peace in Toronto, Blue Suede Shoes. You've got My Old Friend with Carl and Paul doing that duet. There is an amazing song, which I love to play on my show, which is one that George Harrison mm -hmm. plays right. on called Distance Makes No Difference with Love. An incredible... Mm -hmm ballad which is wonderful and you can you can hear george on backing vocals oh, on there I mean, it's, and it's his slide guitar work yeah is, is yeah incredible. i was gonna say i was gonna say the slide guitar work on that song is is, is stunning it's it's gorgeous mm -hmm. yeah so. and they also took a live version of honey don't from one of the all-star bands that ringo was in and they added call perkins to the recording so it was like a duet right mm -hmm. yeah so uh so that's pretty unique to itself that all four Beatles are on that CD. When does that happen? Yeah, that's true. In fact, <laughs> right. I got I got my copy courtesy of uh, um, the other the other New Jersey resident uh, in this grouping. Yeah, that's a great record. <laughs> yeah, that is a great record. Well, I was going to say there's a there's that great film of George playing. Is it Your True Love at Carl's funeral? Yes. Um, uh -huh. um, that is that is tremendous. Um, it used to be on YouTube, but I, I don't think it's there anymore. But I'm sure it's out there somewhere. Um, but that's worth hunting down if you haven't seen mm. it. Yeah. So. And I just wanted to say because we were just talking about the the live concert of Carl Perkins and Friends, a rockabilly session, also yeah. called Blue Suede Shoes. Right. That is right. one of the most amazing live shows mm -hmm. ever. You know, yeah. and I often cited just... as a top five post Beatle moment. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. I mean, whether you George. count a concert or a, a TV appearance or a, or an album or anything else, uh, that is absolutely top five material. Yeah, yeah, yeah because the, that was that was when George came out of uh, hibernation. I mean, he oh, had yeah. done anything for a long time before that. Oh yeah, so, I mean, recording careers didn't get much deader than his was at that point. Yeah, they just didn't. Right, and he mm -hmm. came out. He looked like a million bucks. Yeah, he really did. Oh, he did. Yeah, and I re and I remember Olivia saying he was thrilled. He was absolutely thrilled to do it. Yeah. So, and he looked like a, a little boy uh, observing the master yes. on guitar. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's just so it's so funny to watch that. But the performance of Your True Love, which uh, yeah. Tom was just talking about, is one of the greatest live moments ever for many of the Beatles because yeah. you've got Paul mm -hmm. Perkins. Uh -huh. George Harrison and Dave Edmonds all sharing lead vocals. Yeah. It's one of the greatest moments. You just if you've never seen it before, I'm sure it's on YouTube. Oh, yeah. You know, look at it's it. On, you, it's 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 just wonderful. It's on C D and D V D. It's been released. Right, commercially so. released. Mm -hmm. Right. It's been commercially released so you can get it. Oh, I, yeah. yeah. And I and I'm pretty sure much of it is on is on YouTube as oh, well. Yeah, I'm sure. Oh I'm sure it, I'm sure it is. There are outtakes mm. too. There are outtakes. Yeah, there yeah. Outtakes I, I remember that there was outtakes of a uh, you know like a separate taping of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In which uh, Carl gave gives George the same introduction, you know, saying, you know, well, people say he's retired, and uh, that's not what I've heard, you know, something yeah. like that. <laughs> well, you know, there's a great clip. It was from uh, one of the news outlets, CNN or something, uh, where they were promoting the show, and. The, the mutual admiration, like the, the, pretty much all the clips they use were like kind of like 
Harrison and Clapton, you know, like grinning, like, like, holy crap, there's Carl Perkins. Oh, and they yeah. cut to George and they said, you know, what's it been like? And he says, I offered him a cigarette. And he said, do you mind if I don't smoke it and keep it as a souvenir? And it blew me away, like, that he would do that. <laughs> you know, because <laughs> Carl is his hero. You know, he goes, yeah, it's always great to meet your heroes. So uh, yeah, it's a funny story. Yeah. All right, Al, your, uh, your take on the Tug of War album. Funny thing, uh, one song that nobody has mentioned thus far mm-hmm. is Someone Who Cares. Oh, my God. And somebody Who Cares. Somebody Who Cares, I'm sorry. And that which is an absolute earworm. Mm-hmm. I, I can see myself probably tomorrow morning, I'll have suddenly realize I've been humming of that to myself mm-hmm. in, you know, in my sleep all night. Oh, yeah. Because I hadn't heard it in a long time because I just listened to the album not long before we started taping. And right. it's, uh, it really holds up. Um, the one thing that I like particularly about the album, and Steve actually kind of... Uh, um, uh, clued in on that uh, is its consistency because there was there's a problem with paul's work in the 70s that i always had is that a much of it either from album to album or even sometimes from song to song on the albums there was a he was all over the place stylistically Mm. and you know, even going from the, you know, the simplicity of McCartney to the kind of glossy sheen of Ram to the very stripped down wildlife and back again on Red Rose Speedway and on and on. Same kind of thing. And especially with all the different lineups of wings and all, there was just something just a, a maddening type of inconsistency to his work in the seventies. And this one has, you know, a, a great deal of consistency of cohesiveness, as Steve said. And of course that's, you know, that can be laid at the, at the feet of, of one man. And that's George Martin, who obviously Paul had not you except for live and let die. Uh, Paul had not, uh, had not used it all in the seventies. And he he gives even though again stylistically there's a lot of different types of types of music here, it all it has a cohesiveness that much of Paul's work in the seventies didn't have. And as I've you know said before here, I'm a I'm, I'm a song person. So and the songs on here are uh, are just are almost uniformly wonderful. Mm. You know, you know, take it away. Uh, as Alan said, uh, that's uh, that really does harken back to those early days of MTV when they didn't really have that many videos. And so the ones they had, they would play a whole lot. And, and that was one of them. <laughs> okay. But it's yeah. a, but it's but it was a great video and it's a great song. Mm. And uh, Wonderlust is obviously one of the uh, uh, one of Paul's finest songs, and and yes, the fact that you know he thought enough of it that to include it in a medley with Yesterday and Here, There, and Everywhere in Give My Regards to Broad Street, I think gives an idea of the quality of the song, and mm-hmm. plus the fact that and and actually the version he does there almost tops the one that's on mm. that's on tug of war yeah and as far as ebony and ivory you know i won't start the rant that yeah. i've that i've, <laughs> yeah. that we I've like gone, the rant. <laughs> that i've gone on so many times before about the fact that you know you absolutely never hear this song on the radio any longer you know, possibly because it's too social commentary-ish. But I'll tell you one thing, considering the atmosphere in this country right now, mm-hmm. you know, with uh, this yeah. seeming war between blacks and police and and all, uh, I think we could use a little ebony and ivory right mm-hmm. about right about mm-hmm. now. It's a song that I've always absolutely loved, uh, either version. And um, it's it was, you know, it was a, you know, a huge hit record. And it's um, in fact, it was the in terms of chart performance, it was actually the biggest hit of Paul's post Beatles career. And it's uh, uh, but overall, the the album itself 
just holds together so well. And, uh, and again, I think that's a tribute to uh, uh, the production work of George Martin. Yeah. Okay. Well, some wonderful comments here, and I'm hearing all this, and my mind is going off in a million different directions. You know, that's, we can go into so many different topics from a lot of what you said here, but my overall impression is that this is definitely one of the finest of the solo Beatle albums. Like everyone has been talking about consistently, I do think that there are a lot of albums before Tug of War that were consistently strong throughout. Certainly Ram, in my opinion, was, and Band on the Run, and Venus and Mars, and Back to the Egg, I thought was extremely, uh, very strong, consistently strong album. Tug of War, I love the production on it, and who's going to argue what George Martin has done for, for Paul and for the Beatles? Mm -hmm. He was the ideal man to call on, and certainly at this particular time, I think, Tom, you were saying this, all eyes were on Paul. Oh, People well, were waiting well. People um, were waiting yeah. to hear what he had to say, especially right after John died. This was his first album after John. Well, uh, you, know, you know, even uh, I, for those uh, who are listening that read the Beatle fan blog page, the something, uh, something new blog, um, there's actually a link in there that we put in there to a review of the what I called then relevant Rolling Stone. Right. Um, you know, you got a five star, you know, album review back then. It it kind of meant something, mm -hmm. what? But it meant something. Um, but also, in light of the the, you know, perceived carrying of the torch that they they anointed themselves with as as the uh, you know the torch bearers for Saint Lennon, mm -hmm. and and never having really been too kind to Paul in the past. I'm not saying they were licking their choppers, but you know they were they were going to look at this and and you know. And not pull any punches. And mm -hmm. fortunately, they didn't pull any punches. I think they, they, you know, they cited it as, you know, head and shoulders above, you know, anything in his capital uh, to that point, um, including Band on the Run. And, so, you know, it was kind of, I, I think like what my father always used to hear when I, you know, when the teachers would call home, they'd say, this is, you know, we know he can do it. He just doesn't ever really pull it off. <laughs> you know, uh, we know he's capable, you know, uh, and that's the, the seemingly the more manning part. And, and Al, actually, you hit on it. I think you, you you hit it right on the head. You know, if you look at the '70s for Paul, you know those early Wings singles and things. You know, he's kind of all over the place. You got you know, Give Ireland Back to the Irish, and then Mary Had a Little Lamb, and then then it's High High High, then it's, it's something else, and it's uneven. Mm -hmm. um, the albums tend to be uneven. That changes, admittedly, by 73 or so with, you know, with Band on the Run. Mm. Uh, you know, he, he definitely earns his stripes. I mean, you, you can't deny that record. But even after that, you know, some of the albums, you know, Venus and Mars has, has a couple of up and down moments. Mm. Um, London Town, which I, I love that album. Uh, Back mm -hmm. to the Egg, which I love, you know, viewed dispassionately and from a little bit of distance, you know, I, I could look at Back to the Egg now and say, you know, this is the A material and this is the B material. And to your point, Al, about consistency and the songs all being good, mm -hmm. I really don't see any B material in Tug of War. And, and that, no? Al, and I, unfortunately, uh, includes What's That You're Doing. Uh, <laughs> I, I like that record. Uh, it's fun yeah. enough. And by the way, you know, at that point, you got to remember where Stevie Wonder was. Anything yeah. he touched was turning to go. I mean, he to say he was on a roll. <laughs> you know, the music uh, aquarium was not... out, and you know, anything he touched was turning to gold. Um, right. Unlike uh, Paul's next uh, partner of you know of, of that era, yeah. um, mm -hmm. you know, he started collaborating with right after that. Um, you know, so it's not because they were, were hooked up with Paul, but to say that he got them when they were hot would be an understatement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're talking, of course, about Michael Jackson. Uh, I like that record. It's kind of cool that Paul's playing that funky drum stuff in there. Uh, I like that. I love the, the, you know, here before I was saying, boy, it's not like Mark Hudson and their cop and beetle lyrics. But yeah, at the end when they sing, we love you, yeah, 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 um, I thought was kind of a nice nod because at that point, remember, you know, they weren't doing really any, any nods back to the Beatle days. No. Um, you know, that, that would be hard to find on a record at the time. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's, I like that right in the middle, uh, you know, stylistically. Yeah. He's got the, you know, the acoustic ballads. He's got the big piano ballads. He's got the rockers. He's got, you know, the, you know, the string section stuff. 
It's got a little bit of everything, including that funky record right there in the middle uh, with what's that you're doing. So, you know, top to bottom, I, that it's, there are only a couple of them that, you know, a couple of albums that I would, I would, you know, say really don't have anything but a grade material. This is one of them. The songs, even the ones that at the time, we, if we, if we go back in the mists of time, as Paul says, at the time you would hear ballroom dancing on the radio. Uh -huh. you, would, you would hear certainly tug of war. You would hear certainly take it away. Um, you would hear a lot of that material. There were a few I don't think I ever heard outside of, you know, on a, on a show like Ken's or, you know, a specific Beatles show. I don't think, you know, the pound is sinking or, or be what you see or dress me up as a robber uh, were, were big airplays. But you know what? When you listen to those, these are these little pastiches of, you know, this flamenco guitar in there and then some power chords. And you say, you know, this is kind of like the stuff he was doing on the White Album. You know, mixing all the mm -hmm. different types within one song. Um, you know, I, I think getting him out of, you know, out of his comfort zone, that's to say where he writes the material, sings the material, produces the material, chooses the material, arranges the band, and, you know, and calls all the shots. You know, having a separate set of ears and saying, you know what, yeah, Denny can play a little on here, but you know what, we're going to get... Steve Gadd in here. We're going to get Stanley mm -hmm. Clark in here. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. we're going to get people who are your caliber in here. I think was was brazen. You know, Paul. I, I wouldn't have seen Paul doing that on his own uh, if he was calling in other players. Yeah, he'd bring in Eric Stewart or someone like that, but never anyone who you would consider the top of what they do. So Steve Gadd at the time is making every Paul Simon and Steve <laughs> Dan record sound way better than they ever would have without him. Exactly. Right? Um, and, you know, having him on a Paul McCartney record, that's, that's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. uh, him and Ringo playing side by side, two completely different schools of drumming. Having them together, you know, I think worked magically. Well, you know, you raised a lot of good points here, Tom, and I agree with you on most of what you said. I very respectfully disagree <coughs> with your assessment of a lot of, of Paul's solo work. And Ooh, uh -oh. Uh -oh. I, don't, I don't think it's as inconsistent as you say. I do think, you know, I don't really see really low moments in Venus and Mars and, and Back to the Egg and those albums. And Ram, to me, is a masterpiece, too. Yeah, but, um, you know, I, I will say Tug of War, to me, really, song per song is really strong. As being, I'm a huge Stevie Wonder fan, so when I first heard that Paul and Stevie Wonder were working together, I don't think there was anyone on the planet that was happier about it than me. And I was thrilled when Ebony and Ivory came out. I loved the song instantly. I still do. To, to uh, bring up this point about not playing it on the radio anymore, I think overall, radio these days, commercial radio, what they do play, that is older material, mm -hmm. is so selective yeah. And most of Paul's poppier stuff gets dismissed. Mm. You don't really hear, you'll never hear with a little luck all that much on the radio or a good night tonight for that, for that matter. Um, I hardly ever hear silly love songs, but you still mm -hmm. hear Band on the Run and you still hear Jet and you still hear Live and Let Die right. and you still hear Maybe I'm Amazed. You don't really hear the lighter stuff that Paul has done over the years. So Ebony and Ivory, take it away. You're not going to hear those songs anymore. Plus, uh, song, yeah. Uh, plus, it's uh, at least in ter outside the Beatles shows, uh, you're not going to hear, you know, time wise, you know, the an, an album from the early '80s is something that most radio stations now will just simply not play because it's too old, you know, for the desired demographic. Mm. You know, now so many, you know, AC and hot AC stations now are only playing, if they play any 90s at all, that's as old as they'll get. You know, right. they'll, they'll play things from the 90s and mm. then the 2Ks and this decade, and that's yeah. it. So an album from 1982, they're not going to not going to touch and even classic rock radio, you know, probably wouldn't touch an album like this and anymore. Mm. Unfortunately, yeah. unfortunately, very unfortunately. Yeah. But uh, a few things I want to bring up about mm. the album, but um, what's that you're doing? I've always loved all these years later. I must admit it might be one of the lower points of the album only because I feel not that I don't love the song. I think it goes on a little too long. It's over right, six minutes. I'll, I'll now that it's the twelfth best song on the record. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
But uh, like Steve was saying, the songs flow really well. Tug of War going in to take it away was... Oh, my God, that is true. Yeah. It was so perfect. And Somebody Who Cares, thank you, Al, for bringing that up. It's another one of those gems of Paul's ballads. Paul has a habit of... He likes to put ballad songs like in the middle of side one somewhere. Mm -hmm. If you notice that, he just seems to... There is a formula there somewhat in his albums, and he likes to put a uh, something... Uh, a love song somewhere in the middle of side one yeah. uh, here today here today is brilliant no doubt about it really heartfelt and even recently paul was asked what his favorite songs are of his solo career and he rarely ever even talks about it he doesn't like to assess his own work too much mm. but um you know he did point out apart from maybe i'm amazed that he really is proud of here today and that is uh, a good reason apart from the fact that it is a tribute but he is still doing that song every, every tour since 2002. Not you know, only so. that, uh, but uh, one thing that he should really be given credit for is the fact that a couple of live versions of that song in which he basically very nearly goes down the chute emotionally. Oh, yeah. He mm. has actually released. One of them was yeah. on the DVD of uh, Good Evening, New York City. Field, yeah. Right from City Field, and the other one was the his appearance at Amoeba Records in L.A., right. where I right. don't know whether it was because he saw Ringo in the audience or whatever, he absolutely went down for the count. <laughs> right. Yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just a few more things about yeah. the Tug of War album. Ballroom Dancing, I've always called, since the very beginning, the greatest single that never was. Oh, yeah. It really should have been a single, probably the follow-up to Take It Away. Some people might think it should have been the second single ahead of Take It Away. But everything about that song is so perfect. The vocals, oh my God, Paul's vocals oh, yeah. are just spot on. The arrangement, the brass, everything. I mean, it was just, it's a perfect recording from start to finish. Um, the Pound of Sinking is one of those songs. There are certain songs throughout the Beatles' history where you've got song fragments and you string them together. And like Uncle Albert Admiral Halsey is one of those great examples or a band on the run. And actually, Happiness is a Warm Gun is one of those songs where you've got three different songs, you string oh. them together, and somehow they make sense. Oh, look at and Band on the Run. <laughs> that, right. I was just saying that, yeah. yeah. But uh, The Pound is Sinking to me is one of those songs, and I love how his voice screams towards the end. There is that, that buildup that gets to that. You know, and uh, I love that song. Yeah, no problem with that one. Wanderlust is a masterpiece. And one of the things that I love about Wanderlust, and unfortunately, I mean, Paul has done this a lot throughout his solo career, but he hasn't done it all that much recently, is he has counter melody in that song. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. So nice. Yeah. He's got so for, nice. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what? for people that don't know, counter melody is having two melodies or more at the same time. Uh, you can certainly hear that in Silly Love Songs. She's Leaving Home has that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, two different vocal lines going on or more at the same time. It's just, uh, you know, uh, an incredible piece of music, Wanderlust. And again, who better to have to arrange the horns and, every, and everything than George Martin? Right. Get it? You know, I love the duets that Paul does because his vocals work so well with other people. Uh, Be What You See, I kind of agree, is like, can you take me back? Or I, I even was thinking of Wild Honey Pie, just a link to go to the next song. Mm. And I really I really love Dress Me Up as a Robber. I think it's a quirky little number, and the, the Spanish guitar part reminds mm. me a bit of Good Night Tonight oh, in yeah. that regard. Sure. And uh, Ebony and Ivory is the perfect song to close with. I think that Paul and Stevie are just a natural duo. They sound great vocally together. The, the melody line is just perfect about Ebony and Ivory. I really wish that song would be brought back more on the radio. It really deserves it. Mm -hmm. um, the only thing, uh, apart from I wish What's That You're Doing would be a little bit shorter, and this is a problem that I have with Flowers in the Dirt as well, which is actually my favorite McCartney album now. Is but, that right? Uh, it is. Mm -hmm. um, Tug of War lacks a rocker. You know, Ballroom Dancing is an up-tempo song, and I love it to death, don't get me wrong, and I love the, the ending of The Pound is Sinking, um, but it needs to rock a little bit. You know, the same thing with Flowers in the Dirt. It had Figure of Eight, which I love the song, but it's, you know, the live version of Figure of Eight is, is stronger than the studio yes. version. single even is mm -hmm. better than the album version. Yeah. Yeah. Because it has a uh, guitar solo, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but every now and then, you know, you wish there was just a real kick-ass song on the album, and Tug of War doesn't have that. But when it comes to impeccably produced pop, 
tug of war is amongst the finest that there is. And so I definitely would rate it amongst the best. But, you know, and, and, and something that you were saying, Al, and, and also Tom talking about the 70s, Paul, you're going to have a great debate out there between people, especially the ones who's, who grew up on Wings in the 70s period, who favor that period more than Post Wings. The Ram Army. And, the Ram Army. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not just that, but there are people out there that really love the 70s, Paul, and, oh. and the people who feel that he lost a lot of edge. Maybe he needs to be in a band more. He does his best work with a band as opposed to working with different people. That's a whole other debate as well. But no, look, like you were saying, I'm, a, Tom, I'm, a, I'm one of them guilty ones. I'm a, I'm a wings nut. Uh, uh -huh. I love them. And part of what I like is that it's so diverse. But when you, you go to assess the catalog you know, in its entirety and say which, which parts stand on their own, you know, I, I think what makes some of his singles great is that you get, you know, a rocker on one side and a little country thing on the other. Um, mm -hmm. You know, even the albums, you know, that you get this whole cornucopia, but to get something, I think Al used the, the term cohesive, uh, something that kind of stands as a unique body of work. I think this one stands, you know, stronger than anything he did in the 70s. Uh, one of the things that I love most about Paul is that musically he is amongst the most eclectic artists that are out there. So Tug of War is an album that displays that. He's oh. done a lot of that throughout his solo career. So there's, there's really no difference. In fact, I think he's been far more experimental after Wings than during the Wings period. I think mm -hmm. there was more of a formula that he had to keep with it being a band. But, um, you know, Tug of War was a, a good example, although McCartney, too, he was experimenting a lot. But here he has all these different styles of music and they're all strong all the songs are strong for the most part yeah. so um you know that's that's uh where i think consistently comes comes into play but i do love the ones that i mentioned from the 70s if you're talking about prior to this yeah. so you were going to say tom yeah so while he's not set any precedent with this you know we, we know that this uh tug of war um, archive release is coming I, I haven't heard even a, a, a an estimate of a street date, mm -hmm. um, but we can assume it's this year. And he is on the road now. You know, I know when when I remember when Ram uh, came out in the archive series, people we like, said, "Wow, maybe he's rediscovered them all, and he'll play <laughs> Monkberry Moondelight or yeah. Uncle Albert finally, right?" Right, nothing. Um, you know, and we got nothing. <laughs> <laughs> nothing. Uh, um, if if you know he immerses himself in tug of war and kind of refamiliarize himself and said, Oh, you know, I kind of like this and maybe I should air a little bit out. Okay. Well, he's already doing here today. So that's out of the mix. And let's face it. It ain't going to work with Brian Ray doing ebony and ivory. Uh, maybe it, Abe Laboreal. Mm, maybe. I, I think that's, that's too much of a Paul and Stevie song. Um, well, I, I'm Hamish, sure. Stewart. Hamish Stewart sang it with him. Yeah, it was terrible. Um, <laughs> terrible, <Whoa. laughs> terrible, just terrible. Um, maybe Kanye will turn up. up. Yeah, maybe Kanye yeah, will turn up. So we we'll get, we'll get the filthy version of him. <laughs> um, but what? What? You know, if he had a poll one, what would you say would be the front runner? If he says, "Oh, p fill this one in." Hey, you know, we've been remixing all the albums and putting them out in the archive series, and everybody goes, "Yay!" And he says, "And the new one that's out is Tug of War." And here's one that. That we never played before. What would oh. it be? Wanderlust. Ballroom dancing. Ballroom dancing. I'm gonna go Wanderlust. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I I would I would want it to be ballroom dancing, mm -hmm. but I think he might want to do Take It Away. Ooh, yeah, like right. I know, I know, I, uh, I know he's mm -hmm. very fond of that song, and I could probably hear Wix do the the horn arrangement on the keyboard sure. since he doesn't have, you know, a horn section with him. But I prefer for it to be Borum dancing. But I, I certainly wouldn't mind if he did the title track to Tug of War. Yeah, sure. Can All I right. interject I, something here? Sure. I can you. I I disagree with you about the about the fact that there's it's, there's not a kick-ass song on the album. I think Ballroom Dancing is it. I think no, I'm he, just saying. I'm saying as a ahead. rocker. You know, I think of Ballroom Dancing as a great pop song that's up-tempo and is arranged perfectly. I'm talking more guitar-oriented, you know, really rocking kind of a song, mm, like I, like a Jet, like a Helen Wheels, 
like a Venus and Mars rock show, like one of those songs. That's what I'm thinking more in terms of rockers or, or material like from Back to the Egg. I'm talking about that kind of rockers. I think I think vocally it's it's quite a rocker. If he does his long tall Sally voice on ballroom dancing, I think that 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 makes it a real rocker. I think, and you know the way he did it, the way he somewhat did it in in uh, the movie, I think he really took it to, uh, uh, to a different solo. level. <laughs> <laughs> well, there we you go. Can say- you can take a lot of his songs, and when he does them live, they have a lot more of an edge to them. Yes. So, right. I mean, Venus and Mars Rock Show is, is I love the studio version, don't get yeah. me wrong, but there's a lot more of an edge when you listen to Wings Over America yeah. of a song like that. Yeah. Um, you know, song that he did from, I, I think, from, from uh, Venus and Mars, and especially from Speed of Sound, I think sounded way better live. Yes. Yeah, I you know, I've always pointed out "Letting Go" is a standout oh. live song. Yeah, one, one of the finest. Call me back again. I mean, geez, I mean, yeah, yeah. So I think, yeah, live ballroom dancing would rock. I think it would really fit very well as a live song. Mm. Um, okay. But but you know something, and I know we want to we want to end this conversation because we are up to an hour. But you did say that you think, Tom, that this is not only Paul's best solo album, but the best solo Beatle album. You're going to have a real strong debate on that from all Beatle fans, really, well, because there's, there's so many other great from the other Beatles, too. Well, and, and it has to be and, one, right? One. OK, if it has to be one, to me, this is it. Um, you, you know what's wrong with All Things Is Past? Nothing. You know what's wrong with Imagine? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> what's wrong with Band on the Run? Nothing. Um, they're all fantastic, fantastic albums in, you know, in, in so many different ways. Right. Um, I mean, to me, this, you know, from top to bottom, the one that I could listen to without, uh, to borrow a phrase from Alan, you know, having some urge somewhere to hit the forward button. Mm. Where would I hit the forward button on uh, on the Imagine album? I'm, I'm not sure I would. But, I, you know, one day one of them will get to me. It'll be, I don't know, I don't want to be a soldier. I don't want to. Yeah, okay. there you go. Um, if, that's, if that's my 10th favorite song off Imagine, guess what? It's still... Very much in place, and a, and a, and a you know a very good part of a very 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 good album. Mm. You know, all things must pass. Which version are we talking about? The one with the live jam or without it? Okay, the live jam thing, nice to have, love it, like having it's Johnny's birthday and the pepperoni and all that nonsense. But <laughs> the, you know, but boy, as a double album, wow, incredible. As a triple album, wow, incredible. Mm. Yeah, and by the way, you know. Rounding out that top ten is a bunch more Paul albums too. Sure, sure, uh, absolutely. We've talked about Band on the Run and certainly Ram. You know, in that top ten somewhere uh, in that sauce, I, I've got probably Chaos and Creation in the backyard. Love absolutely. that. Absolutely. Um, you know, another cohesive album. I don't think the songs are as strong top to bottom as Tug of War, but it's still a very, very solid album. Yeah. You you were mentioning Flowers in the Dirt before, Ken. I've always since since it came out, which I can't believe now is twenty five, twenty six years. Twenty six years. Um, I've always felt that that album had some of his very, very, very best songs on it, and then mm-hmm. it had a bunch of things where you don't want to be in between me and that forward button. Okay, <laughs> uh, and there there are a few of them. Um, that I, I that I mean I give one as an example. We got married. I just didn't. I just think is a oh wow total, total throwaway song. Um, oh, I love that one. Even That's one of the of Costello favorites. songs that you want her too is just mm. it's so contrived and it's it's so it's so not as good as the other Costello songs. Yeah. yeah. Um, How about Uwe U- Lasole? Is yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah. That is you're doing it. It's the same kind of. <laughs> but you know some of the some of the the very best ones that are on there. I think a song like that day is done. I think is. You know, mm. Solid as a song as he ever wrote or co-wrote, mm-hmm. uh, as the case may be. I have to admit, I I didn't like "We Got Married" very much until I heard him do it live. I get, yeah, that was another one that improved on the mm-hmm. the eighty nine ninety tour, yeah. you know, right? On the yeah. studio version, yeah. Right, right. So no, I mean, yeah. and to me, that was a very a very to me uneven. Had so the highs were so high. Yeah. So, and to me, the lows were really. I said, "This is the kind of stuff people dismiss him for." That was that. That was my own take on 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 Flowers in the Dirt. But you know, the, the songs that are really good, 
are 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 just exquisite on that album. Yes. Hmm. Okay. Well, you know, I think uh, perhaps we could do a show on what we feel is the greatest solo Beatle album mm. and bring Tom back, and then we can debate the other ones that uh, he was mentioning. I'm sure there are plenty of fans that think that All Things Must Pass deserves to be number one. Mm -hmm. the, uh, there's a lot of other McCartney albums, like you said, Tom. There's a number of ones from uh, John. We were just doing a show on Mind Games, and you sure. know, Al said it was to him the most consistently strong album from his solo career. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you and know, we still I, I haven't mentioned like, the Ringo album. Sure, Ringo. That's right. And you know what's kind of weird is, and you know, Al has written a couple of pieces for this, as of some of the other Beatle fan writers for the uh, Something New blog, where we are basically just no, in no particular order, just pick. Picking, picking ones we think folks should revisit. Uh, uh -huh. and I did a, a very thoughtful piece on uh, on flowers in the dirt. Mm -hmm. You'll be almost apologetic that uh, his yes. initial <laughs> reaction to it was less than thrilling. Yeah. Um, and what's kind of interesting is when you see the feedback. So you, you know, okay, there's going to be you know a few trolls out there that yeah. are just going to you know dismiss whatever they read. But the reaction to the tug of war one ra literally ran from. Okay, Tom, this is, this is just your sentimentality talking. The album must have had some particular place in your life, and it's not that great an album. Up to people who said, wow, finally, somebody got this album the way I did. I think this is the best record, too. Um, you know, and, and everything in between, you know, and then the, you know, the more balanced ones. Hey, this is a great record, and yeah, people should hear it. Is it up there with All Things Must Pass and Imagine and Plastic Ono? Um, yeah. Maybe, maybe not. But that's that's what makes it what it is. That's what makes the, the the blog what it is. Is you know we express the opinion. Again, you know the the trolls who have nothing better to say. You know what are you smoking? And you know mm. you, you probably voted for Obama. And you, I mean they're yes. all over. <laughs> um, so and, and not only that, Tom, but I, I just think that it's only natural with. Well, I hope most people that opinions change through the years. Oh, and you know, now, uh, is that true? <laughs> yeah, no, I'm always consistent. Now. Yeah, there, there could be an album that you dismiss when it first came out, and now you listen to it ten years later, twenty years later, and you say to yourself, "This wasn't so bad." And okay. likewise, there might be there might be albums that you thought highly of that you're not as fond of now, and that's just the nature of of people and also how they can relate as they get older to certain albums too. I, so nothing I, ever stays the same and nothing well, ever should stay the same. Well, I, I agree with you that, you know, the revisiting, you know, something that you did have some kind of soft spot or touched you in just kind of a way that was really good. And then now you say, well, that was all right. Uh, or other way around something you never really gave much thought to that. Now you say, wow, this is really, well, this is really good. Mm -hmm. My punchline to this story is, the very first time I listened to Tug of War, I got home, put it on under headphones, and you know, not unlike most albums, you know, you expect that you know you'll you'll have some initial reaction, but many times I think, Ken, you you've cited this many times on your show, when you know Paul puts out an album, it takes you a few times to kind of get it, to kind of take it all in. Mm -hmm. I got to uh -huh. tell you, from the very first time. I listened to that record. I remember when Ebony and Ivory shut down, sitting there between the two speakers with the headphones and just sitting there, jaw on the ground saying, oh, my God, that was yeah. unbelievable. Mm -hmm. mm. And I have, I have never wavered from, from that feeling. Any time. I've never gotten halfway through that album and said, eh, you know what, let, let me, where's my copy of Living in a Material World? Where's my copy of, you know, Gone Tropo or, or Stop and Smell the Roses? I put that thing on. It is it. Uh, it's a forty-five minute commitment, um, mm -hmm. and I, I never even pop it on and just say, "Ooh, you know what I want to hear? I want to hear the pound is sinking." I, I don't think literally in in twenty uh, thirty two years, yeah. thirty three uh, years, uh, there's there's been very much of that. Uh, to me, that's always been a a start to finish beautiful piece of music. Okay. Yeah. Mm. All right. Ken, by the way, well, you. Uh, uh, Tom just mentioned living in the material world, and if I'm not yeah. mistaken, oh, well, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, that's your all-time favorite solo Beatles album, isn't it? It's my favorite album from anyone. <laughs> 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 Tom, <Yeah. laughs> 
So uh, whether they were in the Beatles or not, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's no doubt that the Beatles, as a group, put out so many masterpieces, and I don't want to argue with that. But they put out a lot of great ones on their own that deserve a lot of attention. And I think living in the material world, despite the fact that it went to number one when it first came out, the album. It's kind of neglected now. And and I love it because I love the spiritual side of George. And even though he's got spiritual songs throughout a lot of his solo albums, I think the most powerful to him and the most personal to him, you can't touch Be Here Now. Be oh. Here Now in, in terms of the message of what he's saying in, in the song and the way he's delivering it is just so powerful. The fact that every word is said like it takes up a whole measure. Yeah. It's so slow it's driving the point home. It's like a mantra. It's well, just uh, incredibly powerful. But, you know, all the other songs, The Light That Is Light of the World, Who Can See It, he's saying how he feels about his place in the world at that time, and people aren't really getting him. The, that's very, very personal. And certainly a lot of the songs on All Things Must Pass were. But I just think that because those songs and the melodies and the arrangements and his incredible guitar work, I, I really love that album to death. Um, that is all is, is one of the greatest love songs ever written, despite the fact that most people don't even know it, mm, yeah. <laughs> you know, except for the hardcore fans that follow all the all the solo music. You know, it's just uh, it really is from start to finish a great album. But I'm not going to argue with anybody that says Tug of War or Band on the Run or All Things Must Pass or Ringo, <laughs> whatever. Yeah. If that's your favorite, then God bless you. Well, but you know, that's the point you made before, Ken, about, you know, revisiting those. I remember, you know. 30 some odd years ago when uh when we first met and you you're on dha and al and i used to come down there and at the time you know you were you were reading from that you know from that gospel saying you know this is the greatest beatles you know solo beatle record my favorite record by anybody and i, I remember thinking you know hey, I, i'd like it enough but it I, I, I wouldn't have been in my top 10 even mm. and in recent years for any number of reasons i i have rediscovered that album you know, was the the reissue that came out on CD, mm -hmm. um, you know, to, to go rediscover it. Frankly, um, you know, having done a couple of interviews to help Gary Wright with the uh, promotion of his book, right. um, you know, discussing some of the songs with him and asking him what what some of his favorites were, and I said, mm, let me let me go chew on those again. I mean, I know them, but I'm just not sure they would have ever been in my top fill in the blank five, ten, whatever. But now, be here now. If I if I were making my top Ten Harrison songs, you can bet that's in there. You can right. bet on that. Um, that that is it is a wonderful, wonderful song. I mean, it just it's immaculately sung, immaculately played, well written. It's it's a, it's a whole bunch of good adjectives. It just is. Um, in a lot of ways, that particular song to me, it's George's "Within You, Without You." I have a solo career. It's, it's it, slow. It has a powerful message to it. You know, it's yeah. just, um, you know, it's, it's what he's saying with that song that mm -hmm. really hits you hard. If, if you, you know, if, if those words mean something to you. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, to me, that album for many, many years, obviously the hit, Give Me Love, and, um, you know, Don't Let Me Wait Too Long, another single that never was. Mm -hmm. um, right. And even the title. Shouldn't this be another show? Yeah. <laughs> well, we, yeah, I was going to say, we have two nominees already. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, yeah. well so oh, we, we should do it. We should do a living in the in the past uh, in the material world show. You know, as a, well, as that, a separate yeah, show. or the uh, each of our favorite post Beatles albums. Well, I mean, in light of tonight's conversation, I guess the show should just be called "What's the Second Best." Song? Yeah, ex well, yeah, <laughs> right. Or in your case, just have. <laughs> I think we made the case for tonight, right? Yeah. yeah. Here we go. But, but you know, just a closing thought here, and yeah. that is, I was just talking about how impressions change over time. Mm -hmm. There may be Beatles albums as a group that you appreciate more now than you did before. Maybe Sgt. Pepper always was your favorite and now it's Revolver or the White Album or something like that. I love talking about that because that can change over time for whatever the reason. And we can bring into focus why that is. You want to know the reason? You want to know the reason? <laughs> you want to know the reason? The reason. I'll tell you the reason. Because <laughs> it's too why? much trouble. That's why. <laughs> We had to get it in there somewhere. Absolutely. Yeah, come on. That's right. Yeah. And obviously, well, I mean, Alan hasn't mentioned that his favorite solo Beatle album is <laughs> like Life, Life with, with the Lions. Lions. That's right. 
Mm. I'm sure that'll be in the conversation when we talk about our favorite solo Beatle albums. Yet it's but, not right. the worst of all solo Beatle albums. Oh, that. that's that's another show. <laughs> that's another show. <laughs> Let's save all this for another show. Okay. Sounds good. So this Sounds has good. been this has been so much fun talking with you, Tom, and talking about the Tug of War album. And if any of you would like to get in touch with us, you can do so by writing to us by email at our address, which is things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. Also be sure to like us on our things we said today, Facebook page. So yes, for this really fun discussion on tug of war, special thanks to our co-host for the show, Steve Marinucci and Alan Cozen, Al Sussman, and our special guest, Tom Franjone. Thanks so much for joining us for things we said today, and we will see you next time.